Good morning. Hey, hey. Welcome back to your hour. Hello everybody and welcome back. Today and this week, we're gonna be looking at the concept of length. Now, last time we looked at weight and why it was important to be aware of how much things weigh and being able to read scales. Now, we're gonna learn about the importance of length, why it's important to know how long certain things are and how we can read it. So today, we're gonna to introduce two measurements for length, just like we introduced two measurements for weight. Those two measurements are centimeter and meter. Now, you might feel familiar with this concept, and that's because a few weeks back, Miss Sandra showed you that cent means 100. We've talked about that there's 100 cents in every dollar. That's because the word cent means 100. For example, the word century is 100 years. Another word that begins with cent is another maths word, and that's centimetre. A metre contains 100 centimetres. And that's a bit of a spoiler because we know that 100 centimetres is equal to one metre. But let me show you an example. I've got this ruler here, and I put it up close. You can see that centimetre goes along this line. Now, your average ruler is going to be about 30 centimetres long. So now, if I got more rulers and I stacked them next to each other until I got 100 centimeters altogether, that would equal one meter. For example, I'm roughly 1.68 meters tall, which isn't very tall at all. Maybe just past average. average. So I also mentioned those are some of the ways that we use measuring height. We often measure how high we are and our height changes. So for example, if I measure how tall my little boy is, he's not really tall, he's almost a meter. But if you measure someone really tall, like maybe Mr. Zane or Mr. Daniel, who are quite tall, they might be 1.8 or 1.9 meters, which is a lot taller than me and a lot taller than my son Titus. So those are just two of the measurements that we use to measure how high or how long something is. We use centimeters and we use meters. Stay tuned and we're gonna to continue to elaborate on the different ways that we measure height. For our words of the week nine, we're looking at the language of height. The first word is the word height. Now, we measure height with many different tools. Some are larger, some are smaller. We also measure many different things. Let's spell it H E I G H T, height. Now, the first word is millimeter. Millimeter is the smallest method of measurement, often used by tradies to get precise measurements. Let's spell it M I L I M E T R E, millimeter. Now, our next word is the word centimeter. You can find centimeters on your ruler to measure small things like a desk or a chair. Let's spell it C E N T I M E T R E, centimeter. Now, our next word is the word meters. We use the measurement of meters to measure things like people or even a footy oval, and sometimes even tall buildings. It's spelled M E T R E, meter. Our next word is kilometer. It's the longest form of measurement that we use to measure the distances between places or the ocean even. It's spelled K I L O. M E T R E. Good afternoon and welcome to today's instalment of STEM Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics. Today's session 
is a math-based one. And it is called roll call. Now, for roll call, apparently it involves rows, and a row goes across. And the co stands for column, so obviously going down. And I've been told that it is a card game. So, at this point in time, you know as much as I do. I've got some rows, I've got some columns. Let's see if we can find someone who can show us how Rocco goes. The first thing I'm going to do is turn this card over as my marker card. This game is played in rows and also columns. The winner is the person with the most points at the end. So I'm playing rows, so I'm going to take the nine. I'm playing columns, so I'm also going to take the nine. This is my new row because of the marker card, so I'm going to take the eight. This is my new column. So I'm also going to take the eight. This is my new row. So this game is played until either all the cards run out or one person can't move. I'm going to take the ten. Now I've got no more cards in my row, so I can't move, so the game ends. I'm just going to count up my cards. To make it easier, I'll see if I can group them to make it easier to tally up. I've got 10, and if I've got um, 8 plus 5 plus 7 is 20. I've got another 10. 9 plus 4 plus 7 is also 20. So I've got 10... 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 as my total. I've got two eights and a six, which equals 22. Two nines, which equals 18. A six and a four, which equals 10, and a 10. So nine plus nine is 18. Eight plus eight plus six is 22. So that equals 40. 40 plus 10 is 50, plus another 10 is 60. Because both sets of cards happen to total up to 60, we've tied.
Welcome, Welcome back. back. Today's word of the day is Altna, meaning, meaning eyes. So have a go at saying Altna. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Altna. Altna. Good afternoon, Yurara, and welcome to week nine. I'm sitting here in the welcome room and it's been so quiet this term. Normally, there are about 40 students who come through this classroom on their first day at Yurara or during the first term that they are here at Yurara. But as I said, it's been so quiet. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed the stories about Olaf and Elsa and some of the things that they've been doing. Let's now continue with our topic, persuasive writing. Remember the illustration that Miss Fleur used, the Oreo, in helping us to understand the procedure used in persuasive writing? Begin by stating your opinion, give reasons, then evidence, then restate your opinion. Now this week's not words of the week, but phrases of the week are... I am sure, I believe, I know, I am convinced, and for this reason. The word convinced, convinced, convinced. The dictionary definition is to persuade by argument or proof, to cause to believe in the truth of what is alleged. And let's Look again at our phrases that you'll be using later on in the week. I am sure, I believe, I know, I am convinced for this reason. After Elsa had spent some time with Olaf going over the audio song again, and helping him to make stronger arguments, she checked if he understood. So do you feel I explained the Oreo song a bit better, Ola? Do you think you'll be able to make some stronger arguments to convince Mum? Yeah, Elsa, I'm feeling a lot more confident. Firstly, I'm going to explain that when we go out for the day and Sven is left alone, he gets lonely. Secondly, when Sven gets lonely, he acts out and digs holes in Mum's garden, which really annoys her. So you see, if we got another dog, Sven wouldn't be lonely anymore and Mum wouldn't have holes in her garden. What do you think, Elsa? That's much more convincing, Olaf. Mum gets so frustrated when Sven digs holes in her garden and getting a new dog would definitely help Sven feel less lonely. I hope Mum agrees. Come on, Elsa. Let's go speak to her now. Elsa and Olaf went to find their mom to see if they could persuade her to get a new dog. Welcome to another contest segment of Yara to You. For those of you followers that love basketball, here's a few basic fundamentals to help improve your game. Here's a few dribbling drills you can try. If you have a half court, dribble up right hand. Make sure you're not looking down at the ground. Make sure your head's facing in front so you know where you're going. Always start off right hand first to halfway and then left hand going back. If that's too easy, try to speed it up a bit.
Or if that's too easy, what you can do is try a crossover while you're dribbling up to halfway and back like this. Or you can try it through your legs. Same thing, two dribbles and then put it through your legs. Or the last one you can try, the same again, two dribbles and then behind your back. Make sure when you go behind your back you get down nice and low so you don't get it knocked out of the way. So there we have it. Try those if you've got time by yourself. This, these are drills that you can try if you just got you and no one else. So work on those, improve your dribbling, let me know how you go. Now on to our layups. Instead of doing your normal run up layups, here's a different variation you can try. So you want to make sure you're underneath the basket and where you can see the backboard. So we're going to start off with our right hand. So if we're going right hand layup first, you want to use your right leg as well. So right hand, right leg goes up at the same time. Just like this. And the same with the left hand. Left hand, left leg. So now that you've done the forward hand layups, what you want to try and do is try and make 10 on each hand. So after that, you want to try the reverse layups now. So same again, under the hoop, and all you're doing is it's just the reverse. And then same again, 10 on each side. Last but not least, is form shooting. So if you have a friend, you can take turns. You can shoot and then your friend can rebound or you swap over, your friend shoots, you rebound for him. So all it is is come close to the hoop. When you're getting ready to shoot, you wanna make sure you're nice and low, bend your knees and as you shoot, you wanna keep your shot the same. So you want to make three and then move to the next spot. Next spot, right in front of the hoop. And then last spot is here. If that's too easy and you want to challenge yourself, you take one step back and repeat the process again. Three at each spot, just working on your form. Because I don't have a friend, you gotta chase your own rebounds if you miss. There it is everyone. There's a few basic fundamentals that you can try to help improve your game. Remember to have fun while you're doing it and stay safe. Laters. Word are, and welcome back to another health episode with Mr. Zane and Mr. Liko. Today, we are excited to introduce to you the first part of your assessment for our choices and wellbeing topic we have covered this term. Come with me. 
Last time, we showed you all the different options that you have so you can show us just how much you understand what we have been talking about this term. By now, you should be able to show us or tell us the four different parts of your own personal well-being. Just to remind you, they are social well-being, physical well-being, emotional well-being, and mental well-being. Today, we will break down for you the first part of your assessment. This is the brainstorm assessment. But firstly, what is a brainstorm? Let's take a look. A brainstorm is a fun and effective way for you to put down what you have learned about this term. A brainstorm is a one, easy to read model and a common way for you to share what you know and to show your understanding about making good choices and your personal well-being. Hey, Mr. Liko, what does a brainstorm look like? Thanks for that, Mr. Zane. Yes, there are lots of different ways that you can draw up a brainstorm. We have drawn up some of our own examples of what a brainstorm looks like to show you. Take a look at these cool models. As you can see, there is lots of space to write down all your ideas about each of the four parts of your personal well-being. Each brainstorm has been divided into four parts for you to complete. You can simply draw up your own by copying these brainstorms onto a blank piece of paper back in your community. Ah, that's right Mr Liko. We have made it easy for you to draw up your own brainstorm by either using one of our templates or designing your own brainstorm to share your own ideas. To help you even more, Mr Liko will now complete his own brainstorm as part of this assessment. There we have it. This will be the first part of your assessment to test your understanding about how your choices can affect your personal well-being. Give it your best shot and have fun creating your own brainstorm. Next time, we will introduce to you the first part of your optional assessment, which is an interview. This will be a good chance for you to talk to someone from your community about what you have learned this term. Till next time, good luck.
VR fam, welcome back to another exciting episode of VR to you. I'm Miss Tina, and you're back with another episode of Art. Today, we're going to be drawing Lady Beetle. Isn't that right? Hey, wake up. I'm up. I'm up. So, for today's lesson, we're going to be needing a pen, a pencil, and paper. Because we're going to be drawing a Lady Beetle. So let's get find Miss Priscilla, and let's get drawing. Okay. We're going to be drawing a picture of a ladybug today using a fine tip black pen and we're going to be using some of those different shading techniques that we practiced in the last lesson. So the first thing that I would do would be to find a picture um, or you can, uh, you can do this one that I'm drawing. Um, but if you would prefer to, you can find your, your own picture, trace it in grey lead pencil, and when you're happy with it, you can go over those lines in black pen. So I always put a border around the outline. Okay, and the second step now is to add the shading. So I'm going to be using a combination of those different techniques. So the first one, stippling, lots and lots of little dots. And colouring in the spots. And I'm going to be adding some contour hatching. So I'm following the circular motion of the ladybug. And then I'm just doing some little crisscrosses to add some shading. Remember to make some of these areas darker, we can just start overlapping. Which is what I'm doing here. I'm clustering those dots really close together to make it darker. overlapping my cross hatching to make more shadows and you can start to see the ladybug uh, looking a bit more three-dimensional rather than just something that's flat on my page. So there we have it, a ladybug using hatching, stippling and contour hatching. Welcome back to your house. 